I, I paused it while we were chatting. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, I'm Kelsey Steinrau. I finished, uh, I graduated Tufts in 2010 and I graduated from the Fletcher School in 2011. I did the dual degree um, BA MOLD program while I was at Tufts and I've been out of school about 10 years. Um, originally when I left Tufts and Fletcher, I, all of my career has been in the international nonprofit sector and I worked largely in monitoring and evaluation research for common ground doing evaluation work across the Middle East and North Africa and elsewhere. For the last few years, I've been living in the United States doing various types of nonprofit work. I just moved to the Seattle area and right now I work for the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the organization behind Wikipedia, where I do sort of global community management work to make Wikipedia more diverse and inclusive. That's me. Great. Uh, Lizzie? Yeah, so I was, I see a message that um, I think we are having some issues here in Kelsey. I don't know if that's the same issue for me now, or if. Uh, no, know. you're you're loud. I could hear Kelsey, but maybe there were a couple. Could you guys hear Kelsey? I was also having, she, 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 she sounded very quiet. I could still hear her though. Maybe, okay. All right, Lizzie, okay. please you go. <laughs> Um, so my name is Lizzie Robinson. I graduated from Tufts in 2015 um, and did EPIC my junior year. Um, pretty much a few weeks after I graduated from Tufts, I moved abroad um, and haven't really moved back to the U.S. since. Um, so I'm currently in Jordan. I, I've been here for three years now, have previously worked in also um, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, I'm currently the Asia Regional Lead at a company called Magenta that focuses on social and behavioral change communication, um, which essentially means we look at how to improve behaviors and, and social norms in the development sector. Um, and so I, I have not gone to grad school yet. Um, I believe the other three panelists have. Um, so I, I will be kind of advocating for the why you should not go to grad school now um, perspective. Elaine? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, so my name is Elaine Stecker. I graduated from Tufts in 2014. I also did Epic with Lizzie, so that was my senior year um, among a bunch of other IGL programs. Um, after I graduated, I worked at the Fletcher School for three years, and then I started my master's um, in international relations at the University of Chicago, which I took an extra year on um, and finished in 2019. And then I matriculated into my current PhD program at UCLA. Um, I'm pursuing a master's in statistics and a PhD in political science. Um, and before that, I did market research consulting, which I still continue to do. So I've kind of walked two different tracks simultaneously, which I don't know if I would necessarily recommend for all people, but it was really important to me that grad school not close any doors and just open them for me. So this has kind of been the path I've taken. And Lume? Hi everyone, good morning, good oh, afternoon, we can't hear good you. evening. Oh, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, Lume Wong Murphy graduated 2011 from Tufts. I did Epic in 2010, um, when it was the city's theme, still very salient. Um, through the IGL is how I met my husband, actually, um, Pan Murphy. And uh, I'm currently, I'm a corporate strategist at AB InBev. Um, so we are the largest CPG company by EBITDA. You probably know us by some of our brands like Corona, Stella Artois, Budweiser. Um, uh, previously, at the very beginning, I started off my career on Capitol Hill. So worked for Senator John Kerry and Congressman Scott Peters um, on climate change, agriculture, energy policy. I went to grad school, I, went, I pursued my MBA um, in, uh, from Kellogg at Northwestern and it was to make a career change. Um, and after that, I be, was a strategy consultant at Deloitte and now I'm a corporate strategist um, at AB InBev. So I'm happy to talk about business school, um, if it's right for you or not, um, and, and when to go. Um, it's very much a personal decision and um, look forward to speaking with you guys. Great, great. All right, um, why don't we start with um, Kelsey, do you wanna talk about kind of your decision to go to grad school? What made you decide to go and, um, and how that's kind of played out for you now? Yeah, can you hear me okay this way? Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, 
So I actually wouldn't recommend the course that I took to graduate school, going in straight from being an undergraduate. I honestly, I did, well, I did Epic in 2000, Seven, two thousand eight. So <laughs> a long time ago. Um, <laughs> but I really wanted to have a career in the type of work that I was studying in Epic. I wanted to do, you know, work in basically global conflict studies. And so I thought that the Fletcher School would be the best route for that. Um, and that's the kind of things that I studied in graduate school. But what I've really come to learn over the sort of intervening years is that um, a lot of the, I think, more thematic and area study coursework that, that I did instead of getting like a straight professional degree like business, law, medicine, and so forth has been a lot harder to leverage career-wise, um, especially if you don't live in D.C., or you are committed to having a career abroad for sort of the rest of your life. Um, and so it's been a little bit of an inflexible choice that I've found a lot of ways to sort of like hack and be creative and, and try different opportunities. And I'm happy with where I am right now, but that's not a pathway that I would recommend for someone unless you're really interested in like academia or you have a lot of control over where you live. What, um, what areas did you focus in when you were at Fletcher? Yeah, um, well, so the best choice that I made at Fletcher was I studied monitoring and evaluation, and that was a really hard skill set, um, and I worked in that field for a number of years, and I've just moved away from it a little bit more recently, so that's a good track. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I did like political theory studies, conflict studies, I did some mediation coursework, um, and that's just been a lot harder to make use of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right, um, Elaine, you also went to, well, you worked at Fletcher, and then you went to grad school pretty soon after. So do you want to talk about that? Sure. So like we may mentioned, I went to grad school kind of to pivot into a new field or at least a new position. Um, I saw it as a way for me to get out of what was kind of becoming a dead end track for me. Um, while I loved working at the Fletcher School, I ended up like doing so many other things on the side to try to supplement what I was doing. Um, like I was an RA for various professors at Fletcher. I also worked on a negotiation project with a professor um, and a mediation project. And then I also, what else did I do? I worked as an RA for a Harvard project. So I felt like I was just kind of scrambling to find meaning in what I was doing. And so then it made sense to me that one, I wanted to like reorient myself and like have kind of like a fresh start after an MA, which is why I originally started pursuing an MA. And I also wanted to learn like some harder skills as Kelsey was saying. So because I was employed at the Fletcher School, they let me take classes. So I learned um, programming, like computer programming. And then when I started my master's in Chicago, um, I also like continued to learn programming and started learning math because I really wanted, uh, like Kelsey said, I pretty much am in agreement. I wanted to learn a harder and more concrete set of skills that I could point to and say like, not only do I have these analytical skills, but I also can functionally like write code and um, do regressions and defend this causal interpretation of what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so the biggest um, reason that I went to grad school when I did was I got a full scholarship and I have <laughs> really encouraged people not to go to grad school unless it's funded um, and hopefully fully funded. I think that it would have been unbelievably difficult to not have funding and still be paying off my undergrad loans. And I did work throughout my master's and I'm still working throughout my PhD, but the work I do now is to supplement my stipend instead of to try to make ends meet. And so it's just a whole different ball game in terms of stress when you have funding. Um, so I did get a full ride to Chicago. And I think the little things I was doing along the way, like that RA work I mentioned and working on these projects extracurricularly did help me get funding but I also only applied to programs that supported their students. So um, I did get in other places and some places were in DC and I did actually get into Fletcher, but like you have to be aware of how much aid they're able to offer you and how much you know, you're willing to kind of give up on that funding in order to go to a more prestigious school. But I think University of Chicago is not bad. So that's where I ended up. And then again, I'm fully funded here in LA. So a lot of my decisions have been based around funding almost exclusively. I did two, you no, know, I did three rounds of applications to grad school until I accepted one um, that met with both like the funding I needed, the location I wanted, the reputation the school had to hopefully propel me into where I wanted to go. So a lot of my timing, yeah, was based, based on money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. And Lume? Um, uh, the choice to go to business school, I think, is most people um, don't go directly from undergrad 
um, mostly because the schools themselves look for practical experience um, before one applies for an MBA. That being said, I think the best advice I received in um, whether I should pursue a law degree, an MPA, MPP, or a business degree um, came from one of my former bosses. And at that time, I was thinking hard about uh, trying to get a master's in, in public policy. Um, and it was actually a legislative director for John Kerry. And he pulled me aside and he said, um, you know, it's about opening up your future options. And at that time, back in 2014, I think context is everything. At that time in 2014, um, business school was going to open a lot more options for me. So that being said, I think for all of you, it's also taking into account your context. Um, you know, what is it in a post-COVID world? Um, I think about um, Patton, my husband, he went to grad school um, a year after he graduated. He graduated in the middle of the last financial recession. Um, and so there are lots of trade-offs one will make in thinking about going to grad school, whether it's to accelerate your career, make a career change, pursue a field of study that you absolutely love and are passionate about, or perhaps also to, you know, kind of ride out um, certain things happening in the wider world. But in any case, MBA, better to, better to work a couple of years and then go to it. Mm -hmm. And Lizzie? Yeah, so I, I worked basically exclusively in, in international development since I graduated. Um, so I guess my perspective is, is really focused on that sector. What I've found is that there's a perception that it can be very hard to break into kind of the international NGO sector. Um, which, which I agree, it's hard. I, I think it's hard to break into every, any sector. Um, but I think particularly with, with this field of work, people feel the need to get a master's in order to break in, um, which is, has really been contrary to my experience. Um, and in my experience with applying to jobs and also recruiting for positions within my current organization and other organizations, experience matters so, so much more than having a degree. Um, and I, I think a lot of people either, um, again, they, they kind of don't know how to break in, they don't know how to get that first job, they, they're, you know, they're not quite sure how to make that transition from maybe DC to abroad, um, and they, they feel like a master's can be a, a, a track to that. And I mean, it, it, it could be, I'm not going to say a master's is, is never, you know, it's not going to be ever a good decision, but I think, especially in the, when you're kind of just starting out in international development, development I think, there's so much more to learn from jobs and experience and from getting a master's. Um, I've worked with people who have gotten um, master's in, you know, international development, international economic policy, whatever it is, um, kind of in their, their early and mid twenties and they still, they still don't seem to know what they want to focus on. Um, and I, I think if, if you're going to dedicate, you know, one or two years of your life to a, a grad degree and, you know, quite a bit of money, um, again, kind of in the sector of international development, I really think it's helpful to have an idea of, of kind of where you are currently in your career, where you want to go, and how that degree is specifically going to help you get there. Um, otherwise, I, I think, again, experience is much more valuable than a master's. Um, I mean, just, I think there is a huge gap um, between kind of what academia is going to teach you and, and what you're going to learn, you know, quote, in the field. Um, so again, I would just, I would really encourage people to do try to get experience, um, even if it's frustrating, even if it's difficult, which it always is. This is never easy. Um, but I, I, I don't think getting a master's, say, in your earlier mid-20s is, is a good um, way to transition inter international development. Um, I, I'm personally waiting kind of another few years and then um, we'll probably, as some of the other panelists have said, we'll probably use my master's to pivot a little bit towards the education sector, um, again, within international development. But that's, you know, after I've had five and probably it'll be, you know, seven years of, of figuring these things out and, and thinking through what I really want to do um, before kind of taking that step back and, and getting a master's. I wonder if um, each of you could Lizzie, you brought up the experiential aspect. If you guys can talk about kind of the experiential aspect that might have gone along with grad school for um, Kelsey, Elaine, and Lume, you know, like what were you able to do? Was that helpful piece? 
And um, as a second question is, how did your majors at Tufts play into your decisions for grad school? Happy to, to answer that. So Kelsey, um, do you want to start? Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Can you still hear me all right? Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, in terms of the experiential aspect, so the MOLD program at Fletcher is a two-year master's, so the experience piece, and there's internships you can do, of course, while you're studying, but the main one is the summer in between, and I interned at the Asia Foundation in Sri Lanka. Um, I have found, and this is true for me as an undergraduate and a graduate student, that um, international nonprofits give really crappy internships. I mean, and people really, I mean, I work in that sector now, right, are just generally too busy and scrambling too much within the sector. There's not like a lot of because, of, because a lot of organizations are short on money, they don't have as much budget comfort to do advanced planning, and that often puts people in, a, in the work position of just sort of working in a short-term way, and that limits employers' abilities to build really meaningful projects. So I usually had internships where someone would come up with a report for me to write so they could ignore me at a desk for the three months that I was there. Um, so I don't think that that was particularly helpful, um, honestly. And um, I agree very much with everything that Lizzie said because she sort of made the choice that I wish that I had done, which was like just focus on experience rather than try to get a master's in what I was already doing as an undergraduate, which was international relations and peace and justice studies. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Elaine? Sure. So like I mentioned or alluded to, I think that being really intentional with the kind of coursework you're taking and the kind of skills that you're trying to acquire was important for my experience in grad school. Like I went into grad school knowing that I wanted to come out with like, I had, I think three goals and I was like, everything I did had to move me towards one of those goals. And one of them was learning programming. One of them was um, like making myself more attractive to consultancy firms because I thought that was something I wanted to do and I did end up doing it. So that worked out. Um, and I also really wanted to network in grad school. I felt like I really didn't network well at Tufts. I triple majored, I graduated, you know, magna cum laude. All I did was school. And then I got out of school and I had nothing really. I turned down the first job I got offered for extraneous reasons. And I realized that I like, hadn't networked. I didn't really know anyone. And I didn't know how to, like Lizzie was saying, I didn't know how to break into any field in any sector in particular. And so that was like a really, harsh wake up call as a young person scrambling to find a job. Um, and so when I went back to school, I was really, really intentional about networking. Um, I would say most of my best experiences came not from my classes, but from the opportunities that being in a school system afforded me. So being linked to organizations. So there is an organization like the IGL at Chicago and I linked up with them. And that was really cool. I got to meet Obama. Like that was like one of the best parts of uh, my experience there. And then learning hard skills, being able to, you know, say now that I'm very proficient in R, I know Python, I know Theta, I know a bunch of very overlapping skills at this point. But that was a really important part of my experience. And then just being really intentional. Like I think it's so easy to see grad school as like the logical next step, especially when, as I'm sure everyone here is, you're a high achieving student, you're very smart, you're gonna have really great opportunities and just making sure that you're using those opportunities and kind of like milking them for all that they're worth in terms of getting you towards where you wanna be going. And I echo everyone else, if you're not sure where that is, maybe take a couple years, see what it is that you're liking and disliking in your career and then pivot from there. Great, thanks. Rume? Um, so I will say I loved my business school experience, and I think this is a common thread that you find across um, MBAs, and for three reasons. Um, the classes, the people, and then the internship experience. So for the first one, the classes, it's an extremely practical uh, curriculum, and it's all case studies. You're just reading and discussing what other people and organizations um, have what decisions they made and why. It's really studying decision making. Um, and the professors are fantastic um, at any top school and all of you, if you applied, would get into top schools. And it's very dynamic. It's no one spends all their time studying, but the classroom is, is intense and focused and you get a lot out of it. Two, the people are extremely smart, engaging, 
Um, and you just end up, you know, I ended up forming amazing bonds with people. You end up traveling to all sorts of places. I mean, it's just really a, a fun time and a good time. And a lot of those bonds last beyond school. And then thirdly, the internship experience. I think this is, you know, if you are to pursue an MBA, this is really the reason why is because of the connection with employers, right? So you're not going to go to and pursue an MBA if you want to work at a particular small startup. That's not really the best use of your time and, and uh, resources. But if you're seeking to try to make a career change, work at Amazon, Walmart, a big consulting firm, a PVC firm, whatever it is, the internship, um, for the most part, extremely structured. Um, the employers come on campus. And so you have that access and it's extremely organized. Um, and so for those three reasons, like for me, MBA was right and I loved my experience. And what was your major as an undergrad? Oh, art history and international relations. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, one of the questions is how much does your undergrad degree kind of lead you to the next step? How do you feel like that happened? Like to where you are now, not necessarily to grad school, but to where you are now. Lizzie, do you I, want to start there? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, so actually two points. Um, I absolutely agree with Kelsey that internships and international NGOs absolutely suck. Um, this is one of my biggest pet peeves of the industry and something that I just, I really think there should be more emphasis on improving for all of the reasons that she said. I actually also interned with the Asia Foundation um, in DC, which was like kind of mediocre. I've had worse. Um, in terms of coursework, I... I think it's important not to let your undergrad degree kind of put you in a box in terms of where you want to go with grad school. Um, I, I've, I've seen so many cases where, you know, people do whatever in undergrad, somehow, you know, end up working in international development and then go on and get a master's in, in something much more development oriented while their, their BA had nothing to do with that. Um, I think also it's, it's worth thinking outside the box. Um, I think because we come from the system of, of US universities and kind of, you know, how things worked at Tufts. Um, there could be uh, an incentive to find a, like a similar master's program, maybe. Um, I would encourage everyone to take a look at um, universities outside the US, specifically in the UK. Um, I have done a bit of research on, on grad programs kind of in the international development sector and have found that in the UK, the, the course offerings are a lot more specific. Um, so, for example, they'll, they'll have a specific master's degree in gender and education in international, international development, which is just far more specific than you would find in the U.S. Um, I think a lot of the programs in the U.S. are kind of your, your general MPP. Um, so I, I've just found there's a lot more um, kind of options for specialization um, from universities outside the U.S. Plus, no GRE, they're cheaper and they're one-year programs, so you're um, you know, a lower opportunity cost in terms of not working for a year. Great, great. Um, Kelsey, do you want to talk? Sorry, what was the original question? This one? Well, I, I guess part of it's going into um, how your undergrad degree right. led to both your choices, but what you're doing now. Like, you know, so yeah. you kind of understand like the shift that may happen after. Sure. So because I rolled straight from my undergraduate degree into my graduate degree, and they were basically all the same type of studies and coursework, like there wasn't too much pivoting going on. And it has had me working in international nonprofits, which I've done. And I've worked for some big ones and some great ones, but it's sort of been more of a process of like feeling on the horse and then off the horse. Like when I'm able to live in a location and, and effectively leverage my network and my skill set to get an awesome international development job, then I have one. And then when life makes me move somewhere else, for example, I just moved to Seattle because my husband is a medical resident at the University of Washington. Like every time I move or you have a life change that you can't control, I've been unemployed for like a period of a year or so mm -hmm. um, before I find a new, a new role. Um, so I like what other panelists have said about finding a grad program that just opens a lot of options because it has been a little bit harder to pivot. I do think like I'm finally old enough and long enough out of school that I have enough experience to leverage moving forward. And I don't really need to talk about my graduate school experience because I've done enough. But 
yeah, it was all pretty linear and I wouldn't recommend doing it that way. Mm. Elaine? Sure. Um, I think majors? that. <laughs> Sorry. What were, your, what were your three majors? Um, IR, Arabic, and Middle Eastern studies. Mm. Um, I would say that more than the degrees I've talked about, like the experiences that I've had. So kind of lumping this back into the experiential question, like people were a lot more interested in like, oh, you like lived in Jordan or like, oh, you traveled to Iraq or oh, you lived in Nicaragua. Like what's up with that? And like, yeah, I had an Arabic major, but like it was far more useful to be able to say like, oh, I know like these people at the University of Jordan or I've done this and that. And I think that's carried through. Like people don't ever ask me about my undergrad beyond like, oh, you did these interesting things. Like, can you tell me about that experience? Mm -hmm. So it was a lot less about like the things on my degree and more about like what I did along the way as I was obtaining them. And I think that's definitely held true. Like so many of my opportunities came from doing RA work. Like, so I would do my coursework and then I would meet with professors and then they'd bring me into the projects that they were doing. And I think like, that's really the only way to get like meaningful work experience in terms of like understanding if you want to go into academia, especially how to create projects and like source funding and get grants and how to like frame things and present them. And, you know, just carrying those kind of projects from beginning to end, if you're there long enough, has been like really far more important than anything like I had specializations in my master's I don't even remember what they were like really like my like I said mining what you're doing for those experiences that are going to make you both a better employee or a better student or a better teacher mm -hmm. and then also like giving you that network like far it doesn't matter what you're studying really if you're able to do those things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great we may I don't think I've talked about my Tufts major to an employer um, for several years now. Um, but I think what, what has been helpful is that in the process of applying for grad school, if you choose to do so, um, I think you're forced to do a lot of self-reflection. And I had to really ask myself, like, what do I want mm -hmm. in the next three to five years? And in thinking back about my Tufts experience, there are two things that I really took away. One was that being an art history and IR major, and especially going through the IGL and EPIC, um, you all are fantastic writers. Fantastic writers way above the skills of many, 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 many people. So take that away. And then two was that I loved, I actually really loved studying art history and international relations. And so when it came time to thinking about, you know, what type of work I want to do, I'm very happy at um, a global organization, right? Every day I get to talk about what's happening in Colombia or Mexico or UK or in China. Um, and so those, I think, reflecting back and thinking, oh, I pursued it because I was passionate about it um, is, is helpful. Mm -hmm. Great. And Lizzie, do you want to talk about how you, you said it was hard breaking in. So what did you have to do to kind of get the internships or get the experience or end up in the position that you're in now? So I was fortunate enough to be able to take an unpaid internship for six months, right, uh, basically after I graduated, which I 100% understand not everyone can do. Um, that's how I did it. Um, I think, though, what I often tell people is that it just comes down to luck. Um, you... And there's so much competition for some of these jobs. You know, you really just have to be kind of the right person in the right place at the right time. Um, and maybe an organization needs to be desperate enough to hire you, um, which which is fine. Sometimes that's that's you know how it works. Um, so I think, I and I think Elaine's point about networking is super super important. Um, I'm sure this is true for all sectors, especially in international development. You need to have someone flag your CV. Um, or else there's absolutely no way you were getting an interview. Um, and I think also when I- how did, you, how did you build your network? Um, so I, I saw something on Twitter the other day actually that said networking is the worst way to build a network. Um, I really hate like professional networking. I think it feels really inauthentic. Um, I, I, I mean, you, you have to do it but I think there's a way to go about it being authentic and being humble about, you know, kind of where you're coming from, being honest about where you want to go. Um, also just being straightforward with people like, can you introduce me to your colleague who works in the livelihood sector? 
um, rather than like dancing around with this really polite language of, you know, I would be so appreciative if, um, I, I mean, I, I prefer when people get straight to the point, I'm happy to help, but, you know, give me something concrete that I can help you with. Um, I, and I think it, it is really about putting, it is about putting yourself out there, um, reaching out to people, you know, asking to be introduced, having kind of informal chats with people so that when, um, when a job does come up, um, you already have those, those relationships and, and can follow up. And I think, I think generally people are, people are willing to help. Um, everyone is busy. Um, you know, everyone gets multiple sorts of these requests on a regular basis, but, um, I, I think, yeah, it does really help to kind of find those, those people who are more entry points, um, into, into the sector. I mean, through the alumni network, um, for sure. Um, you know, ask friends of friends, go stalk people on LinkedIn, see who they know. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm also happy to speak with anyone on this call. Um, if you're interested in, in international development, um, and it's, it's not, it's not easy. It takes years. Um, but, and I mean, even like five years out of undergrad, I still feel like I don't know anyone, um, which is objectively not true, but just there's, there's kind of, you always feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I think it's a, it's a slow process. It does require being proactive. Um, it will always feel like you are not getting anywhere, but mm -hmm. slowly you will. <laughs> Great. Um, one of the questions I had is about um, the development of both soft and hard skills, analytical skills and hard skills and what you think is important, you know, as people are thinking about heading out in the next, like say, you know, two to four years into the job market, like what are you seeing as important skills to have? And if people are double majoring or not double majoring, you know, is it, is it, what would your recommendations be? Kelsey, do you want to start? Sure. Um, before answering that question, though, I wanted to go back to a point on networking that I actually think is really important. Um, to me, by far, the most successful way to network is once you have your foot in the door at any kind of new place as an employee, as an intern, or currently while you're at Tufts, is to meet as many people in the context of figuring out what they need and how you can help them. Um, and so that's, I think, by far and away the best approach and something that's made me successful in a lot of different roles and makes for an authentic way to connect with and meet people. And especially when you're new, you can introduce yourself to folks at new teams and departments under the guise of learning. But once you learn about them and like what they're looking for and the problems that they can't solve, that's a place to make networking really stick. And then you can back that up with some LinkedIn stockings because you have that connection once you've left the organization. Um, Heather, can you repeat your question one more time? Sure, I think it's looking at kind of developing like soft skills, hard skills. What are the things that that you find most useful as you kind of start to go out in the job market or looking for internships if you're still in grad school, you know, and what would be good to focus on, you know, because sometimes like there's advice, yeah. well, you can major in IR and economics, but is it better to do like IR and computer science or yes. you know, like, what's valuable coming out? Yeah, I would definitely recommend pairing IR with anything that's hard skill based. Mm -hmm. um, I think anything in computer science or like coding and related to sort of technology, software development stuff is a great bucket. Um, another really good one that's very strongly sort of international development is quant skills, quantitative analysis, quantitative data collection, becoming a data wizard. Um, that sort of thing goes really well. Another um, bucket that I see that's really useful is a communication skill set. Skill set, and this is more than writing. This is sort of being able to do anything related to um, marketing, press releases, like building simple video animations, those kind of things that help people communicate what they're doing a lot better. Um, mm -hmm. I think can go really, really far. Mm -hmm. Great budgeting, also. Great. Um, Elaine. Sure. Um, so I agree with Kelsey that I definitely wish that I had diversified some of those majors. Um, I wish I had developed some really tangible skills. I think that if that's not the track that you want to go down as a student, then you should work on a project or experience that you can point to. Like, for example, in my master's, I worked on a project that had me trying to size how many people, like estimate how many people lived under criminal governance in various countries. 
And so I was like using, you know, like there's no easy way of doing that. And so I was using like population statistics and then like how many people like live without toilets and that would make them vulnerable to criminal groups and where are these criminal groups operating and stuff like that. So then when I was interviewing for the market research uh, consultancy job that I ended up getting, they were like, well, how would you like tell me how many pencils there are in Mexico? And I was like, oh, I know how to do this. You look at, and I like could basically link what I had done to like another context. And so I think that either having a, like having a skill isn't enough and not to like put more pressure on you, but like be able to say like, this is what I did with that skill. And this is how I can apply that like from like this very specific context of like gangs to like this other thing where you know this company l'oreal wants to know how to sell shampoo and like who are their market and so just being able to translate your skills and kind of re reorient them i think is a lot easier if you work on a project from start to finish and you say like this is my deliverable these are this is what i learned from doing this Mm -hmm. and like approaching it that way in terms of like experience and project gaining instead of just like gaining a skill for the sake of having skills if that makes sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely absolutely we may um i think in the in, in the beginning of your career okay. having um being able to say what those hard skills are is important and of course it's more than just that one line on your cv or it's like i know microsoft office right <laughs> please don't put that on your cv um but <laughs> in throughout the other lines of your cv and i think this goes to elaine's point and lizzie's point conveying the specificity of what you've done and the impact of it is far more helpful to me as an employer than writing out the very specific skills that you have. So saying, you know, I've seen on so many CVs, um, people say supported X, Y, Z. I don't really know what supported means. Did you just go to things on the copy paper, on the copy machine, or were you there actually doing analysis, brainstorming, whatever it might be? Um, so I think being really specific about what your contribution is helps show me I'm looking for people who are resourceful, who are creative in their problem solving, like what Elaine said, right? That you'll find other ways of getting to the problem because in real life, there's not a prescribed way of getting to the answer. Um, and that you are um, a lifelong learner as well. I think there's um, a great book I recently read is Range by David Epstein, highly recommend it. So for all those generalists out there, for everyone who studied IR or economics, um, it's a real booster in helping you come up with language and convey that how you think um, is far more impactful than having like an extremely, extremely, you know, specialized, specialized skill set. Mm -hmm. And Lizzie? So I think in the development sector, what, what I found when I'm hiring for, you know, kind of interns who are 22, 23, just coming out of an undergrad program, um, I honestly don't expect them to have the skills that they, like the, the hard skills that they will need for this job. I don't expect them to have technical knowledge about behavior change. I don't expect them to have contextual understanding of Afghanistan. Um, so for me, it's really more about the attitude and the mindset and some of those kind of bigger picture parts of who you are. Um, so we've all mentioned a few of these things. Quant skills are super important, but for this, I would say the bar is like pretty low. Um, I don't think you necessarily, for like an entry level job in international development, you don't necessarily need to know Stata, but you need to be able to receive an Excel data set and make some sense out of those numbers, you know, just being comfortable with, with numbers and calculations and analysis. Um, that's super important. Writing skills, which, which the other panelists have, have also mentioned. And again, like I am continuously flabbergasted at the low quality of writing in the, in the international development sector. Um, so again, like the bar is like pretty low. Your writing does not have to be perfect, but like if you've come out of Tufts, your writing is probably, you know, far better than, than most people um, in, in the sector. Some other kind of qualities that I often look for, humility, um, recognizing that you as a 22 year old do not know everything and that you are eager to learn and want to learn and recognize that the, the people around you have things to teach you. I think that's really important. Um, 
also I like people who read a lot and read widely, I think just come to jobs with a better, a better big picture understanding of how the world works. I think that's really important. Um, and also just kind of an analytical and structured approach to thinking so that when you get a when a problem comes up on a project and you you have to figure out what to do, um, you can break that problem down into different different components and figure out a structured way to address it. Um, in all of our interviews for my company, we actually include a logic question. And for me personally, this question is like, if I, if I only had to ask one question, it would be this question. Because um, how whether people get it right and how people approach it and what they do when they get it wrong, I think is so much more informative about a candidate than anything on their CV. Um, something else that people often ask me about is languages. I, <laughs> having studied Arabic for, I don't know, seven years at this point, including at Tufts and with US government scholarships abroad, you know, et cetera. Um, I, I don't think, unless you are fluent in a language, I don't think it is actually that beneficial to keep studying it. Um, what I found is that as a foreigner, you are never going to be best positioned to be using that language. Um, your local counterpoint parts are always going to be better positioned to be engaging in that language with, um, you know, participants and projects, etc. Um, also, knowing a language doesn't necessarily mean you you have cultural fluency or that the the people in the country see you as their equal. Um, you are always going to be perceived as as a foreigner, and that that creates barriers, you know, kind of separately from from language barriers. Great. Um, another question we have is about um, funding and thinking about how how to know which graduate schools pay, how to know how to think through funding for grad school, especially if you know you have loans coming out of undergrad. And you know, like Lizzie, was that a factor in you not going? Is it a factor in what you decide next? Like, how do you how do you make those decisions? So that you know, Elaine had talked about you know finding all the, all the funding. How do you do that, Elaine? Do you want to start with how you pursued that? Sure. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't have like a easy answer for you. There's no like database that I know of that tells <laughs> you. I think definitely like talking to people who go to the school. Like I was in a really privileged position in the sense that I worked at Fletcher. So one, I knew what kind of money they had and didn't have. And two, I could talk to students that had gotten into a myriad of schools that were of interest to me about the funding packages that they were offered. Um, but like I said, like I did multiple rounds of um, applications and I ended up getting like, I got two or three, I think, offers that were like pretty significant funding, but at schools that weren't like of the caliber I was looking for. And it was hard, you know, you have to kind of adjudicate between the time cost of like, oh, like I'm going to do this again to try to find a little bit better funding at a little bit better school. And like I said, like I was employed, I was really fortunate that I had the opportunity to kind of take this time and really think about it. Um, but yeah, definitely talking to people who have either gone through the application process or are currently enrolled at those schools. Um, going to places like, so I mentioned that there's many places like the IGL, none exactly like the IGL, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> going, going to places that have like bu bu little buckets of money wherever you end up going. Mm -hmm. So I was able to get summer funding through these like various organizations um, that were at the school, but not under the umbrella of the school funding. So mm -hmm. that's really important as well. Kind of like put your eggs in some other baskets besides the normal channels that funding comes through. Mm -hmm. um, also, I didn't do this, but you can have employers that will fund your master's and maybe Lume could talk to this because I know it's more common in the business school sector, I think. Um, but look for opportunities where your employer, I, and Lizzie was also saying this, like your employer is going to want to develop your skills if you don't have them. And so maybe try to find someone that is willing to invest in you in that way and they will cover part or all of your program. That's another way of finding funding. Um, but I think the most valuable thing is to make yourself valuable. And that's why I was doing, you know, all of those research assistant projects and like networking in that way and like really putting my name out there and getting a stamp on projects and getting in those like uh, authorship lines and those like credentials and people thanked me for my contributions. And I was able to point to that and say like, I am about like I'm a value enhancing student. 
Mm -hmm. And when I got funding packages, I was able to negotiate them because I was able to say like, since I submitted my application, I've done this, this, and this, and I improved this, this, and this, and you know, I published something here and I wrote an op-ed there and like being able to really point to specifics about like what you're going to bring to the table. And this is really coming, like I'm in a academia focused program. Like if you're going to be a knowledge producer and you're going to be a professor, you need to be able to point to these things and say, I'm able to produce knowledge. Like I'm able to mentor, I'm able to teach. And that's really what's going to secure you money is saying like, if you pay for me to be in your program, I'm going to pay back your in dividends later because I'm going to be an asset to you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else want to speak to that, to the funding aspect? I mean, I think Elaine hit it on the nail on the head. I think when oh, you, yeah. oh, there you go. Oh, um, I think Elaine hit it on the nail on the head, right? Is framing this as an investment in you. And basically there are three ways to invest, to have you or someone else invest in you. You invest in yourself, you take out loans or you pay up front. you get your employer to do so. I can talk about that. Or three, you get someone else to do it, uh, like the school to invest in you, right? And maybe eventually you pay a little less on your tuition. Now, having an employer invest in you is, um, it happens. And it's not just for MBA programs. Um, there are consulting firms and, and banks out there and all sorts of um, industries that are willing to invest in their people. What comes with that is that afterwards, there's usually an expectation that you will um, provide the expertise and the experience you have gained in graduate school back to, to the organization and to the employer. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times that might be, you know, you work back there for two years. Um, but again, I think Elaine has, narr has articulated it very well, which is if you're able to say why investing is worth it in you and what then the value add you can bring, um, that helps a lot because for a lot of these employers like Deloitte, um, to get the funding to go to a business school or get an MPH or a grad school degree, you have to go through a rigorous process of basically pitching yourself and saying like why you and why this degree and how much more value it'll bring um, to the organization afterwards. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else want to say anything about, about that? I'll jump in just to add that I wish it was more common in international development for employers to invest in staff, um, specifically kind of funding for grad school. Um, I, in, unless you're like quite senior with a very reputable NGO, um, the NGO probably will not do this. Um, just unfortunately kind of how NGOs work. Um, I actually work for a for-profit company and um, my employer has kind of like mentioned this option. Um, so it, it's, not, it's not impossible um, within international development, but probably more common with for-profit entities rather than a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, and I guess going to that in terms of developing the skill of kind of pitching yourself or taking that initiative or kind of approaching schools as you know, as you have something to add to what they're doing versus you being grateful that they're admitting you. You know, how do you, how do you kind of balance all of that? Whoever wants to start. <laughs> Elaine, yep. I think that this is kind of orthogonal to the question, but I'll get around to it. Um, something that was important for me, and I think Lizzie really alluded to this in the sense that you're, you should be humble, is that I was really frustrated coming out of my undergrad program. Like I think I mentioned that I didn't have more opportunities. And at first I was frustrated with like everyone else, but then in turn, like I became frustrated with myself. And I think doing that self work, the work on yourself rather to like see where you're at and where your gaps are and where you want to be going is so, so important to being able to pitch yourself and like having a clear idea of yourself and where you stand and like dealing with whatever baggage or like the things that are preventing you from like going out there and really being able to sell yourself, not to get like too like self-help and self-love is really <laughs> important though. Like you're not going to be able to network if you like have no sense of your own worth and your own value and like what you can bring to the table and like that people should listen to you and like want to network with you. And so, you know, like go to therapy, do whatever you need to do to be able to say like, I'm confident in myself and my abilities. And like, I'm also aware of my deficiencies or the things that I can't do yet. 
and like going off with that mindset, I think is so, so important to being able to pitch yourself, to being able to talk to people. Like if you can't talk to people, like you got, that's like step one, learn how to talk to people and Mm -hmm. to like advertise yourself in a way that makes people want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when it comes to developing the pitch for yourself, um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. I think there might be a lag. Um, I think it's, it's always a more efficient use of your time to develop your strengths and lead with that than say, oh, I've got all these, you know, you know, trying to close uh, certain weaknesses, right? So as each one of you have varied experience, varied backgrounds, and don't at all discount what type of, um, you know, growing up experiences you had growing up. But I think Elaine is right, like coming up with like, what is your, your differentiator, your, your competitive advantage is super helpful for me. And it also, it's, it also is somewhat defined by who you're talking to and uh, who, who you think you might be, you know, evaluated against. So for me going into MBA, there are fewer people who have quote unquote untraditional backgrounds. And so me talking about, you know, um, coming from the hill, that was a huge differentiator, even though every day I'm surrounded by people on the hill and I didn't feel that special, um, but being able to talk about it and it was very different from other people's day-to-day experience um, was kind of kind of my value add, right? I could talk about how policy decisions were made, whereas others were not exposed to that. Um, so I think, you know, always thinking about what are your strengths and then matching that with the context in which you're pitching yourself will help you find in that particular moment how to pitch yourself. Your pitch is going to vary all the time um, depending on who you're talking to or what you're trying to per- what you're trying to get. Um, and so as long as you have a general story of yourself and you can flex up or down certain experiences, um, that will that helps a lot. Yeah, and building on what Lou May said, because I think that's a really good point. Um, and feel free to also change how you tell your story and your narrative and how you frame your experience, depending on the context or the job or the person. Um, and if you don't feel like you have an overarching narrative to your life, because most of us don't, feel free to make it up. Um, I think the, so the example I often give is from my own experience. Um, so in like the year and a half after I graduated, I was moving, I I lived in three countries, each for six months, had three different jobs with three different employers. Um, One way to look at it, at that, which I did at the time, was that I had no idea what I was doing. I was bouncing around randomly. I could not hold out a job. Um, Or I could frame that as I was trying to diversify my contextual understanding of the broader Middle East and Asia region um, and experimenting with different types of employers to figure out what environment I worked best in. Um, So I think it, it, and like, I mean, there's, you know, this old, old phrase, fake it till you make it. Uh, I mean, again, don't be arrogant, but like, you know, do what you need to do to sell yourself. Um, And then, so going back to Elaine's point also about being interesting, I think that the flip side of that is also be interested in the people that you're talking to. Um, People love to talk about themselves. This includes your future potential bosses, you know, hiring managers, whoever you're networking with. Um, So yes, be an interesting person that other people want to talk to, but also be interested in other people's experience. Kelsey, you wanna? Yeah, I can add just one quick piece from the international nonprofit perspective. I think one thing that can be really successful in a pitch that I've used quite a number of times is, when you're interviewing, if you show that you truly get it and you are a true believer in the mission and focus of that organization. So for example, when I was interviewing to work at Search for Common Ground, which is the world, one of the world's largest global peace building organizations, I went into that interview knowing very, very well exactly what peace building is, what it tries to change, why it can be important in people's lives in a really dynamic way. And that can stand out when you're in an interview where they're just talking to tons and tons of people who have IR degrees and are just sending in their resumes to any kind of nonprofit, assuming that they're all the same. Or similarly, now that I work at Wikipedia, I came into my interviews here and I even do this now that I'm an employee, where I can really talk about what the free knowledge movement is, why Wikipedia is the center of that, and why unleashing unleashing free knowledge in every language around the world is key to transforming people's sense of empowerment about the world around them. And that can be an important differentiator. 
Great, great. Heather, can I add one, one thing about pitches? Yeah. So whether you're pitching yourself, your, your, your you know, startup idea, whatever it might be an idea. I have sat through um, quite a couple interviews and one mistake that people make, no matter if they're just starting out or they're you know, 10 years on, of experience under their belt, is sometimes people's pitches can be very long. So time yourself <laughs> <laughs> and make sure it is concise. Brevity oh. is the soul of wit. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. And I have a last question. And this is um, uh, specifically for Elaine and Lume, but um, Kelsey, this may have applied to you when you were thinking about things. And, uh, you know, Lizzie, it may apply to you as you're going forward. Did you consider dual degrees that explore both policy and business? such as MBA, MPA, or MBA, MPP, like did those crop up dual, de like dual programs? You know, it could be law and something, or, you know, did you think about that? Whoever wants to go. I, I'll, oh, I'll just say something really quick on that. It didn't apply to me directly, but I've been very involved in my husband's graduate school decisions, and he just finished an MD, MP, uh, M MPH, a master's of public health and a medical degree. And the way that I would encourage you to look at it is not, I'm, I want to do a dual group degree because I'm interested in two things and like, here's the perfect sandwich, but instead, what is the main degree that you want? And is there a specific professional spin on that degree that the extra, um, that the second degree would help you with? For example, my husband got an MD and an MPP, not because he both cares about medicine and public health, but he wants to be a, a physician who takes on public health leadership positions after working as a doctor for a few years. And so I think that perspective applies to other dual degree programs in a useful way. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Yeah, Kelsey is 100% right. So there are quite a couple of combined degrees, whether you want, um, at least on the MBA side, you can do an MBA, MPH, MBA, MD, MBA, uh, JD, JD, MBA, those are quite popular. And I think it goes back to, at the end of it, how are you gonna leverage both degrees? Because it is definitely more work, um, more money. Um, and so, for example, if you pursue an MBA, MD, uh, a lot of those folks wanna become hospital administrators, for example, or they wanna become senior leaders for scientific research company. Um, if you're getting a JD, MBA, a lot of those may want to maybe practice certain types of law. Um, and so I think it's being very, pursuing a dual degree has to be extremely intentional. And as long as you're clear on what your intention is, um, then you can you know, pursue it with all the fun rigor that you want. Mm -hmm. Elaine? Yeah, I definitely agree with what's been said. Um, as you could probably tell, I was like a big fan of just picking up degrees um, left and right, but you really have to have a reason for what you're doing. And I didn't really look at dual degrees because I decided that the skill set that I really wanted was like the harder science, like computer, computer science type things. Um, and there really aren't a lot of IR computer science dual degree programs. Um, so really what sealed the deal for me with UCLA was the fact that they, like about a fourth, I think, of their cohort right now is able to pursue a master's in statistics through the statistics department here. And because I already had a, like, adjacent MA degree, um, that was really of import to me because I didn't want to waste, like, this opportunity to get a master's in something that I already had a master's in. My master's is in IR, and I would have been getting a master's in political science as a political science PhD. So the fact that this program was able to say, like, you can actually go outside of our department and pursue this. And they also had really close languages with the public policy school. Like, that's kind of how I decided on my PhD program was the other opportunities it afforded me while still being in this, like, very specific context of what I wanted to be doing in terms of my main study. And the other concern I had was that it seemed a lot harder to me. And this was a very surface level investigation. But I wasn't sure if I could get funded for a dual degree program especially because I only had expertise in one of the fields that I was interested in. And so my letters of recommendation were only going to be able to speak to me in that context of international relations or political science. And so I worried that someone coming in with a stronger background in law or in business or whatever else I would look at the dual degree program for 
would have a better narrative and a better set of recommendations to secure any funding that existed around that aspect of the degree program. And I didn't want to compete with those people. So for all those reasons, I didn't look at a dual degree program. But I think that if you have a clear and cogent story or reason or rationale behind why you really need both degrees, you know, like go for it, put yourself out there. And you can always like, as far as I know, a lot of those programs, they may admit you to just one or the other. So you don't really lose anything by applying to both. Um, but don't collect skills just for the sake of collecting skills. Don't collect degrees for the sake of collecting degrees, because I think we may said, you know, it's really time intensive to do multiple things like that. And so if you're not using that time effectively, that's taking away from time that you could have been networking or meeting other people in your specific field of interest or getting an internship that's going to land you a job. So just be really intentional with your time. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Lizzie, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Just to say that I guess dual degrees aren't really a thing in international development. Um, I mean, I've considered doing two back-to-back one-year masters, um, but we'll probably not end up doing that for all of the very valid reasons my fellow panelists have just <laughs> talked about. Great, great. All right, well, I wanna thank you guys for taking the time to talk to us today. We really appreciate it. And for everyone who's been listening, thank you. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Thanks. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye.